Yeah, so uh, today we're going to hear talk about Fig Jam widgets. Let me show you a quick preview so you can also see a picture of me. Where's my camera? Here. Perfect. So yeah, my name is Neil. I uh, manage the engineering and product team for Figma in London, and I'm here with Sawyer, uh, who's based it over in SF. And uh, today we're going to be talking to you about Fig Jam widgets. So we'll tell you about what they are, uh, how you can build your own, as well as some of the juicy behind the scenes details of how the feature was developed. And like Brent mentioned, a lot of you know Figma, but I'm sure some of you don't know Figma. So Figma is an online collaborative design tool that brings entire teams together to collaborate on everything from application design, prototyping, design systems, marketing material, presentations, really, if it's visual, teams collaborate on it in Figma. Uh, and Figma is built like fully with web technology as well. So collaboration is really just like a link away, which is one thing I like most about it. Last year, we also launched our second project or product that we call Fig Jam. So this is a collaborative whiteboarding product built to bring teams even closer. And people use Fig Jam for everything from like designing APIs, ripping on code, um, running projects, brainstorming ideas, like whatever. Uh, we use it for basically everything. Like we're in Fig Jam right now presenting. Um, best feature, Sawyer, give me a high five. Boom, awesome. So last year, late last year, we launched the beta of Fig Jam widgets. And widgets and Fig Jam are obviously what we're here to talk about today, but they're small like mini React applications that can run inside of Fig Jam and extend Fig Jam's functionality uh, to be used in yeah, team meetings, brainstorming, what have you. So you already saw an example of one of the widgets, the photo booth widget, which is great for like introducing new people uh, that come in uh, to teams or whatever. Uh, if you have a hard decision to make, you can always just flip a coin. This is also a widget, roll a dice, play, rock, paper, scissors, or actually use a voting widget. Um, there's also more useful widgets, some would say, like CoderPad that integrates like your interview process into Fig Jam. Or if you're just bored, you can also just play a game with everybody in the file. So this is Flippy Bird implemented as a widget. So all of these, as I said, are just like mini React applications. So let's have a look at how you build these. This is a simple application uh, that literally only says hello agent conf. Uh, so we have our standard kind of React structure here, a functional component, and it renders a containing auto layout and inside of it a text. Now, the only thing that looks a bit different here from standard React is instead of divs and spans, we use auto layout and text. So auto layout is really just what we call flexbox and text is well a span. And the reason we don't use the, the divs and the spans is just because Fig Jam doesn't support all the things you can do with those in the browser. But here we have this meta widget. So it's a widget where you can render a code block. This is a code block in Fig Jam. You can render that within it as a widget. So it's like super meta. But here we can kind of just test the API. So for example, we can remove some explanation parts. We can make this, you know, like super ugly. Uh, but you can see that it's just React using standard React props and so forth. But this is not a super interesting widget. So what I'm gonna show you is how you can build a more complicated widget, something like this. So this is a voting widget it'll display the profile of everybody in the file and allow them to vote either yay or nay. And once everybody's voted, it'll tally the results and show you who won or whether it's a tie. And we're gonna be building this over the course of the next eight minutes or so. And then Sorry is gonna go into what actually makes this possible. So to create a widget, we start with going to the Figma menu here, widgets, development, new widget. And we get a choice between three templates, depending on how much boilerplate you want to uh, basically start off with. And we're going to be starting off with an, the empty project, which is the minimal amount of boilerplate. And I've actually already done that. So let me just try to resize this.
And I think I need to flip my screen share. So I'm clearly not showing my whole screen. Uh, here we go. So uh, now I'm assuming Sawyer or somebody can give a thumbs up that you're seeing the correct thing. Cool. Uh, yeah. So what we have here is uh, the boilerplate we got. So it's a simple frame that just has a black background color. We'll also need to spin up a little dev server here. So we run npm run watch, which is will continuously compile our TypeScript code so it's usable within FigJam. And then from that, we can go in here, go to widgets, development, and just pull in our widget. Now to develop widgets, it works exactly like you would develop a web application really. You have your widget here. I can change this to a red color, hit save, and that hot reloads just a second later. So it's a really nice flow that you're used to. Now let's start building our widget. So I've prepared some code snippets here. We'll just start by copy pasting this in. We'll go through it a bit. So first we're grabbing the widget from the Figma global object. And Figma global object in FigJam is just like the window global object in the DOM. It's basically where all the APIs exist. So here we have some hooks that we'll be using soon and I'll explain more about, as well as some components that we'll use for auto layout, which again is essentially just Flexbox, text and image. And we render out a simple string saying hello to the Figma current user's name. And that would be me. So we would see hello Emil. Let's see here how this looks when we save it. Error. So I've actually already prepared for this error. And what this is, is that we're lacking permissions in our manifest. So the widget manifest is, is basically your package JSON for your widgets. And FigJam widgets by default don't have access to any private user data. They have to explicitly be granted those permissions. So in the manifest, we just say which widgets uh, we require, and that'll show up when people install the widget. So now if we just, it, where is it? Render widget, there. We can see that it says my name uh, and looks great. Well, it doesn't look great, but it looks correct at least. Next is to update the UI a bit. So we're gonna start by introducing this kind of border around it, some nice rounded corners, some padding and so forth. So let's look at this. We have this text that renders hello, my name here. And we're just gonna wrap this in an auto layout. So a container. And this container adds a background color of white, a slight gray stroke, set some padding and so forth. So if we copy in that and hit save, you can see that our widget hot reloads and looks much better already. But compared to what we actually want, this is showing my name as a string and we really want to show my avatar instead. So let's change the widget and update it to instead show my avatar. What we're gonna do here is just replace this text with an avatar component instead. And the avatar we're sending in the me.photo URL, me being the Figma current user. And we're gonna send in a vote of zero. So again, this is a voting widget. So zero means I haven't voted, negative one means I voted nay, and positive one means yay. You can also see the TypeScript complains about not finding avatar, and that's because we haven't defined avatar yet. So like any React app, we split up our application into multiple components and the avatar just renders an image and changes the stroke based on that vote. So now if we save this, we can see it correctly shows my avatar. And when I pass in a vote of negative one or one, it correctly updates that stroke color. But we actually don't just wanna show me here. We wanna show everybody in the files. So I wanna include Sawyer in this as well. So if I move over to the next step here, uh, what we're gonna do is instead of looking at just me, we're gonna look at all the members in the file. So we're gonna go ahead here and declare a new variable called members that looks at all the active users. 
If you remember, we added that permission for active users previously. And we're also gonna replace the single avatar here for me with a new auto layout container with a horizontal direction and some spacing between the avatars that within it loops over all the members and then renders an avatar for each member instead of just that single one for me. So if I replace my avatar with this container of multiple avatars and hit save, you can see Sawyer shows up. So this is great. Now our widget is starting to become collaborative, but you can't actually interact with it yet. So let's have a look at how to implement votes. So for that, we're gonna need some variable to store our votes in. For that, we're gonna declare a new votes variable using one of these hooks we previously imported. So use synced map is much like use state in React, but it's specific to FigJam. And it returns uh, essentially a JavaScript map from string keys to some value. In this case, a number representing the vote of negative one, zero, or one. And the string key in our case is gonna be that user's ID. So we can store the votes for each user. But the cool thing about uh, use synced map is the map that's returned is automatically synchronized across all clients. Even though there's hundreds of people in the fake jam file, they'll all instantly get all updates to this map. So this is the way we build collaborative applications in fake jam using widgets without any extra code. And we're gonna show you how that works in a second. But first, let's make sure we use that votes inside of our avatar. Now, the next step would be to actually allow people to vote because now we have somewhere to store the data but we're not actually changing it. So for that, we'll use another hook that comes with FigJam called use property menu. Property menus in FigJam exist all over the place. Here we can use actually a property menu to change uh, say the syntax highlighting of this code block. So this is a standard menu in FigJam and widgets can define their own. So in our case, we're defining a property menu with two actions one for voting yay, one for voting nay. And then we're handling them here, setting uh, the me.id to vote one or negative one, depending on the answer. If I hit save here, you can see a property menu shows up only when we have the widget, widget selected. And Sawyer, he can vote, for example, and it shows up instantly on my screen. And I can do the same. So again, we now have a fully collaborative application and we didn't write any code at all to really handle web sockets or anything like that. And just for debugging purposes or like development purposes, we can add a new action here, separated by separator for resetting the state. This will just make it easier for us to continue our development here. And here we really just loop over that map and delete all the values. And again, that'll get synced over to Sawyer as well without us doing anything else. If we save here, we instantly see that pop up as an option so we can reset that count back to zero. The last thing we're gonna to do to finish off our widget is just to count the results. So here I have some code that just looks at the total count of votes, sees whether voting is in progress, that's if total is null, or if voting has completed. And if voting has completed, it'll say if it's a tie or who won. We're also gonna add a container right below all the avatars that just prints out that title and subtitle, which we defined above. And here we configure the font sizes and font weight of those text components to look a bit nicer. And this vote count method just returns null for ongoing voting or, uh, one, negative one or zero, whether it's whether who won or whether it's a tie. So now if I select this, press save, we can see voting is in progress. Sawyer, do you want to vote for something? Boom, I'm going to make it a tie. So nay, it's a tie. If I change my vote to yay, yays have majority. And that just instantly works uh, with even up to like 100 people in this file all voting simultaneously. Super cool. And uh, yeah, Sawyer uh, is going to tell you a bit more about how this was actually implemented and how we could make a simple API that does something so complex. 
Yeah, thank you, Emil. Give me one sec to share my screen. And let me scroll down. So Emil told you, how do you build a widget? I'm going to get meta and I'm going to say, how did we build widgets? Um, and just to reiterate, you saw Emil build up a, a widget here. Um, widgets are just little applications that are React-like that live inside of BigJam. And you build them a lot like any other normal React app. Um, but we have some really interesting constraints um, when building these widgets um, that I'm going to go over right now. I think the first big constraint uh, that we had, a lot of these constraints were based on essentially what uh, constraints we have around FigJam itself and Figma, the, the product. We want to make sure that widgets were performant, they're secure, they're multiplayer enabled by default, and it's also developer friendly to make them. So let's start with performance. Um, I will say FigJam has the uh, maybe the weirdest tech stack of anything I've uh, worked on as a web developer. Um, it is written in C++ primarily, um, and it's compiled to, compiled to WebAssembly. Everything you see on the screen um, over here is actually rendered in WebGL. We have a custom renderer for all of this. Uh, the main reason for this is that FigJam supports thousands of things on the, the screen at once, um, and you can have hundreds of people in the file. Um, us being able to like lock down uh, memory management that easily uh, really lets us kind of push the, the boundaries of what we can do in the browser. Um, and by extension, if we're extending FigJam to have all these third-party widgets in it, um, we don't want those to degrade the performance of FigJam. Um, you should be able to have thousands of widgets inside your FigJam file and not see that they're any different than some, something like a sticky that we wrote in C++. Next is security. Um, if you've ever thought about running uh, third-party code <laughs> in someone's browser before, uh, this is pretty challenging. Uh, we don't want to let these widgets be able to read your cookies, mutate the DOM. Um, and we also want to make sure that we only really run widgets when someone explicitly takes an action on them. So they aren't running in the background, slowing down your file, and stealing uh, information on your document. We want to be very clear when you're running a widget or not. Um, next is multiplayer, and um, Emil did a great job of showing off this. Uh, FigJam is a naturally multiplayer application. Um, we can watch each other in real time, move things around on the canvas, um, and uh, everything on the canvas is made to be interactive with multiple people around at the same time. Um, it would be a shame if widgets didn't support this out of the box too. Um, so we kind of want to make this the challenge of creating a multiplayer application easy. Um, if you've ever done something like build a real-time application with WebSockets or WebRTC, you'll know that this is actually incredibly challenging. It is not an easy thing to do by any means. Um, and we really want to make that as simple as possible. And I think our final challenge constraint that we had is we wanted the API to be developer friendly. Um, a lot of the people who are building widgets may not even be full-time software engineers. They could easily be uh, designers who are using Figma. Um, and we want basically building widgets to align as much as possible with like doing normal web development. Um, that's why the, the API looks so much like React. Um, you shouldn't have to learn too many new concepts to build a widget. Um, you should be able to get up and running if you've done some web development in the past. So this is actually not Figma's first foray into building uh, third-party extensions for a platform. Um, if you used Figma before, you may have seen we have a plugin API. Um, it's basically all you do is you get access to the document and you can um, mutate it directly. Um, here's an example of a script, creates a rectangle, it uh, makes it red, um, and it positions it in the center of the viewport. If I run this, we'll see we get a red rectangle in the center of the viewport. Um, and Emil, thank you, Emil, for positioning that out of the way. Um, you can, <laughs> uh, so it, it's pretty straightforward, um, but this isn't necessarily what we want to do for app development. Um, these plugins are kind of like one-off scripts that someone has to install, um, and each user has to individually install them and run them. Um, so if multiple people run the script at the same time, you're just going to end up getting multiple rectangles on the document. Um, there's no concept of sort of multiplayer uh, built in these plugins. They're mainly optimized for doing things like automation or maybe doing summarization of your document. Um, and again, widgets are more like apps rather than scripts. It's kind of how I like to think about them. Um, and if you've done any sort of like modern app development, you'll kind of see things are slowly converging onto uh, a paradigm. If you look at things like React, View, Swift UI, a lot of things have kind of moved to this sort of declarative framework. I declare what I want my app to be, um, and then the framework figures out what it should be. 
Um, and that's kind of what we aim for for widgets. And you've probably gotten here, you've seen the widget code, you've seen a few examples of the widget code, you're like, you just built a React render. Um, and which is, uh, is kind of what this looks like, right? Like you're running some JSX, you get this thing on the screen, um, you set some state, the count goes up, it figures out that it needs to um, increment this count. And there's lots of examples of React renders. Uh, there's one for 3GS, there's React Native, which Emil is familiar with, um, one for VR, there's one for Figma. Um, there's literally a React render for everything. Um, and this is what we did at first. We actually built a React renderer um, here. This is a video from me in April of last year demoing for the company. Um, you can see we basically have a React Native-like API that is rendering out to FigJam's Canvas. Um, and this is what we, how we got up and running in like a few days just to get, get this framework running. Um, but we ran into some snags with actually productionizing this. Um, the first thing is that React actually requires keeping a lot of stuff in memory. Um, and again, with our, our thoughts on performance, you may be able to have thousands of these on the canvas at once. Um, it doesn't necessarily make sense for each of these to basically be, uh, for the entire tree, React tree of these to be in memory at the same time. Um, the next big thing is how do we actually end up syncing the React internal state over multiplayer? Um, one thing that I didn't, I, I, I've, we've kind of glanced over, but I haven't mentioned yet, is that like the way to think about Figma's canvas or FigJam's canvas is that basically each of these nodes is kind of like a DOM node, except we all have mutated at the same time. It's like a shared, a shared <laughs> like DOM tree that we're all mutated. Um, and this is not working super well uh, with React internals. We have to make some pretty big changes to that. And then finally, uh, again, we want to make sure that the code is sandboxed from each other. Would each widget have its own copy of React so that they, uh, they don't have shared state across? Um, again, this kind of gets into that memory issue that we were talking about earlier. So let's zoom back out. Um, and I'm going to kind of show you what we actually built. Like what actually happens when you run this widget code? So here's our uh, JSX widget code again. Uh, looks just like React. Um, the thing that maybe Emil showed off is that when you create a widget, we actually have some TypeScript compiler options so that this JSX actually gets uh, outputs to the uh, figma.widget.h, which is on the global object that, uh, that Figma provides to all of these uh, widgets. And this one works just like React Create Element, um, except it hooks into FigJam's code itself. And you may be wondering, where, where, is this, where does this go? Like, what is happening? How does this get in the global object? Um, this is where it's kind of big brain time. Um, to sandbox each widget, we actually uh, embed a C JavaScript VM into our WASM binary called uh, QuickJS. So we essentially com compile a JavaScript VM into our WASM binary so that we can actually safely sandbox the JavaScript code from other running widgets and from the document itself. Um, there's just not a way for it to escape the document and get, get, get to the DOM at all. Um, and things like figma.widget.h, uh, auto layout, use sync state, all these uh, functions that you saw on hooks, they're actually all defined in C++. And we're basically just exposing them uh, to the VM so you have direct access to them. So when your code calls figma.widget.h, what it's really doing is it's generating a tree in C++ that basically says, this is what I want the document to, uh, this is what I want the document to look like. Um, you're basically saying, this is how I want the document inside the widget to look like, um, and you're building up this tree. From there, FigJam can just look at what's already in the widget and do something that's a lot like React diff to except in C++, to figure out, oh, like, what is, uh, when I click this, the only thing that changed is the text inside the tree. I'm going to use that. My, uh, I'm, I'm just going to update the characters inside of that, that text name. Um, and that's essentially how this works um, under the hood, so that it's sandboxed um, from a, the normal browser, as well as from, um, as well as we can actually only run them when someone directly interacts with the widget. Um, we basically uh, can kill and start this VM at our own uh, will. Thank you. Really got to bump up those numbers. So this was kind of uh, the very basic flow of how widgets work. Um, now I'm going to tell you, uh, there's that magical part about the multiplayer. Um, and uh, we didn't really demo this super well, but if you look at this, if you look at this GIF here, you can see that multiple people can interact with the widget at the exact same time, and it will hit a consistent state. Um, this is kind of interesting. We have four people here all clicking it. 
and I get the view of everyone who's clicked on it at the same time. Um, and remember, like these are like different clients mutating the DOM at the same time. How do we like hit this point of eventual consistency? Um, and it's pretty simple. The simple case is easy to imagine, right? If this is something like React, imagine that we have a people are taking an action one after another. Um, the widget's inserted, it has its blank view. Um, one user, he, he votes on the widget and um, they change it how they, they want it to look. Um, and then later my client gets this update and I vote on it and it looks like uh, I voted on it next. This, this is pretty straightforward. But there's this scenario where different users have different views of the widget at a given time. Um, so for example, in this case, both users have a view of the empty state and we both click on it at the exact same time. Our local clients are going to compute something that looks like this because it doesn't know about this other user's vote yet. Um, and this user doesn't know about my vote yet because they're happening simultaneously. How do we get to this state where both votes are merged um, into one cohesive view? And for doing this, uh, Emil showed off that use sync map hook we have. Um, one way you can do it is you can model your, your state for the application as a map. Um, and by doing this, you can imagine that each vote is maybe the user's name um, in, is a key as one of these maps. So when I send up my vote, I'm basically just adding the key Sawyer to the map. And when Guy votes, he's adding this key Guy to the map. We have a multiplayer server that's written in Rust um, that is basically taking all of the um, scene updates uh, or the uh, document updates uh, up, up, up to the server. And it's basically redistributing those across science, uh, uh, clients. We can stamp the, these, scene, uh, these document changes that we've made with what the, the state of our map looks like at a given time. Then the server can uh, take these and be like, wait, each of you have, have added two different keys here, and neither of you has a full complete picture of what the new merged map is. The server can go ahead, merge these states together. Um, so there's now a combined map where both clients have interacted with it. Um, and it will pick a client to say, hey, you have an out-of-date view of the world. You should re-render this. Um, and uh, that is basically how we do uh, consensus across um, these uh, different clients to make sure that we eventually get to the correct um, view of a widget if multiple people are operating on the same time. And this actually, it sounds like a pretty comp, like long process, but it actually happens super quickly. I mean, if you look at this, this is four people. Uh, we were all remote when we did this <laughs> in different cities, uh, and it just happens uh, fairly quickly, which is pretty uh, pretty exciting for this to, to work so well, I think. Um, and yeah, that was a very, very brief 15-minute uh, overview of sort of peeking behind the scenes of how do uh, widgets work under the hood, um, how we keep them performant. We keep them secure. They work with multiplayer, and we have a developer-friendly API that looks a lot like React, but isn't quite React. Um, and uh, yeah, how you can write some code that looks like this and uh, get something like this. Uh, yeah, that is all I have for you today. Um, I will say that uh, I do, I'll, I'll share out this uh, uh, link in the Zoom afterwards. Um, and you can see that we actually have a bunch of resources down here. If you are interested in uh, learning how to build a widget, there's documentation. We have a bunch of example code on widgets. Um, we have some live streams on uh, widgets. And finally, if you're interested in this piece about building, building the widget framework, um, I can say that we are hiring. Emil is hiring in the UK, um, and we're also hiring in the US as well. So if you're interested, uh, reach out to one of us or check out this careers page. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Great, that was, that was awesome. Thanks a lot. I, I had no idea that. <laughs> This was possible with Figma at the moment. Um, the amount of uh, incredible engineering that that went into making it possible to do that. Um, getting a bunch of claps there. Uh, let's see some questions real quick. Uh, so Michael asked uh, if it's possible to use third-party dependencies. Yeah, that's totally fine. Uh, if if your third-party dependency like depends on the DOM, that won't work. Uh, but if it's like say low dash for you know iterating over some arrays or something like that totally fine nice um i asked which javascript engine is used um because you were saying i think that's uh like 
compiled and included in WebAssembly and running in an isolated yeah, so curious which which engine you used for that or is that a custom thing? Yeah, we use uh, QuickJS, which is written by Fabrice Ballard. Um, it's like a it's a very minimal C uh, JavaScript engine. Uh, it doesn't have jitting. It's basically just a like it essentially just um, executes the script. Um, but most of these are pretty short running, so it, it works great for us. Um, I are, we have eventual plans uh, when the Shadow Realms API becomes out. So basically, lets you sandbox uh, JavaScript code. We would like to use the browsers uh, engine natively, but that's a little while off um, at this point. Cool. Um, Andreas asked, are there any serious limitations about the maximum amount of real-time users at the same time for these widgets? There are, it's whatever our fig jam limit is. It's like, it's over a hundred people, um, I think. Uh, we've tested with like dozens and it works fairly well. Um, cool. All right, I think that's that's it for the questions, unless anyone has a, a quick question they want to drop in here in the next five seconds. Uh, then, yeah, just want to say thanks a lot. That was, that was really interesting, and it seems like uh, everyone agrees based on the amount of claps in the Zoom. <laughs> so, great job, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Brent. Thanks, everyone.